Okay, so last lecture, last chat, last presentation, last confusion. Um, we spoke about we're not in this view, we're in this one, and the one that made it, the word, everything's made in him like a womb. He gives life to it all, Zoe, we don't have life in ourselves. Our capacity for life is reducing it. As we miss love, we become dark, but we're still flowing in their life, life without love. And Jesus, the word has not only just jumped into what they've made, creation, while holding it together, he's jumped into what we made, our loveless dark being. And he's taken that fully as a human. And what we do to him affects us and um, and uh, someone said, well, did it stop when, um, you know, you said whatever we did to him happened, happened to us past tense? No, because the purpose, the purpose of it all wasn't just that. He, he wasn't just a sadist or a masochist wanting to be killed. He was coming in to sort himself out, to share that with us, to share that this life coming up with us. Why? Because we're heading towards John 14, 20, Day of the Spirit, you know that I'm in you, you're in me, I'm in the Father. And the love with which Dad and Jesus are loving each other is shared abroad in our heart. That's, that's what's going on. So it applies now. It applies now. It applied then and it applies now. Now, so therefore, we know from the, pre, the pre-creation purpose God who has saved us past tense and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, not according to what we do, but to their purpose and grace, loving kindness, loving kindness and forgiveness given to us in Christ Jesus before time again. When were you forgiven? Before you were a glint in your dad's eye. My daughter just laughed. So our killing of God was allowed for, our turning on them were allowed for, our darkness was allowed for. And as we said, they met that with nonviolence and by through nonviolence they did our violence in, which I think it's staggering. Yeah. Like I just it does my head in. The, the, now, the Lamb of God was slain before creation. Revelation, all who dwell on earth will worship him whose names have not been written in book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Lamb slain from the found. Don't get caught up in the book of life. We have arguments about that later. <laughs> just, just get caught up in the lamb was slain from the... Foundation. My goodness, from the beginning. Why? Well, what's going on here? Well, when they're making something, do they make it so it's a controlled marionette thereafter? Or do they make it free? If they're going to make it free, do they understand that darkness is going to occur? Yes, given their, they're giving their creation freedom. Are they going to do whatever's required, whatever they can do from their end to make sure that that's dealt with? Yes. Does that involve them coming in and suffering under that? Yes. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. It's all to do with freedom and personhood. Persons aren't persons unless they freely relate. Peter, knowing that you were redeemed, not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. He indeed was before the... This is not plan B, guys. This is not plan B. If you are going to make a universe inside yourself, and because you are so loving, you give it total freedom and darkness is going to go wrong. And because you're loving, you want them to know the love with which you're loving each other and you want them included in your life. One of you is going to have to breach the creator, creator, created divide. One of you is going to have to breach that event horizon. And if you go into a part of the universe that's full of light, they'll love you. And if you go into a part of the universe that's dark, they will beat the crap out of you, but you're ready for it. Well, not plan B. Peter speaking to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Wow. Jesus has come to save us from our mess and heal us. So we quoted this last night. 
you shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will doesn't say forgive we're already forgiven he's come to fix us we spoke about the problem that Father, Son and Spirit are in the universe already, in us already and due to our darkness we don't believe they are so what have they come to do? They've come to fix up our darkness so we can see what is. Now Jesus on earth, and for those who think that the forgiveness happened at the cross when his blood spilt down, all right? But that you know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus forgave sins before the foundation of it, and he gave sins before he went to the cross. Yeah. What? How dare he? That offends me. That messes with my theology. He never asked my permission. But we're asking that our brains get lined up with him. We were forgiven before we were created. We needed saving, we needed healing, and that is not going to be through control. It's through participation. It's through sharing. It's through us agreeing. One of Kruger's lines, he says, you know, we need to ask Jesus to repent and believe in our theology. <laughs> well, the Pharisees used to do that, huh? Yeah. It's such a big picture what they're up against, you know. And what we want to do is reduce it down to our brains and we want to reduce it down to our little conscience and our little brokenness. And then from within our brokenness and darkness, we want to construct our theology. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, so, they've got a problem. We started off by saying Father, Word and Spirit were love. And we said they're the lovers. Now, this is the problem, a very succinct problem, guys. In this part of the universe, the darkness, what's missing? Love. Darkness has life. It has life and we said it can take the life and it can flip it for its own ends, for good and for bad, for ilk, for whatever, but it doesn't have love. Correct? So where there's darkness, there is a flow of life and the flow of life is the flow of Christ, flow of Zoe and... Um, hello, Zoe. And... Um, in the, in the savannah of our minds, we, we see that they're going to have to enter a place where there is no love to bring the love of the Father, Son and Spirit, which is the goal. I have declared to them a will that the love which is in you between us will be in them. This is the goal. Eternal life is the relationship between Father and Son. Eternal life is sharing in that. So this is the love. So this love is going to come into darkness. Now, given that darkness can't see love, are we in a place for miscommunication? Just, just think that through. Darkness is already being held together by the light. The light shines in on through the darkness and holds it together. Not like the gap we've got on the, on the um, paper here. The light shines through and holds darkness together. Darkness is blindness and inability to see love. That's what it is. So Father, Son and Spirit are going to have to come into the human race and the human race is blind to love and they are love. And it's going to take, you're called into love. What a communication problem. How are you going to do this? And by the way, this lot are conscience driven good, bad driven, and we're going to discuss how that happened in the next group of lectures, how the conscience formed. We're constructing everything from the conscience and looking at them through the conscience, and they're not like it. In fact, just in summary, we were told not to eat of the tree of the good and bad, correct? Do not eat the tree. It's called the tree of death. Funny that, because look what happens when life goes through darkness and makes death. We were told not to eat of that tree, there's another tree in the garden called the tree of life. life. And we didn't eat that flippant thing. Right? But after we've eaten the tree of death, 
a boundary was put around it until we could be brought to a point where we could eat it. Wow, two trees in the middle of Eden, death and life, and we are the eaters of the death. And then from within this dome of death, we're then looking at love, and we don't see love or understand or know love. Do you think we're going to miscommunicate, misrepresent God? Absolutely. So who, yeah, and so from the moment they go running and hide in the bushes, we'll talk about that in the next series, but God has an enormous communication problem with humanity. So they take Abraham and they work forward, they get to Moses and Israel, and they then start trying to bring structures, furniture, tables, chairs, icons, thinking, images into our darkness. Not so we can get, excuse this for the Americans, not so we can get our shit together and sort ourselves out. No, so that the coming of the one who made and holds everything together can have some traction and we can begin to see. Furniture of the imagination. Furniture of the imagination, courtesy of Tom Torrance. (laughs) Right? All that section was a paraphrasing of Tom Torrance. Right? So... The heavenly capital. Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come. That's really nice, isn't it? With a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is, not of this creation. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back up, guys. Back, back up. Hang on, hang on, hang on. We had a temple with Moses, right? There was a temple in heaven. Not made with hands. Not of this creation. So whatever is on earth is a reflection of what's in heaven. And with the heavenly one, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place having attained eternal redemption. Are we going to frame this eternal redemption within the understanding of our fallen minds, of a conscience, of a molech, of a God who needs paying off? What is this blood? What is this heavenly temple? Oh, that's interesting. We'll we'll give a quick snippet of it today and a a deeper one in the later sections. The tabernacle of God is with men, the dwelling place of God. Hmm. Now, as part of this, the high priest, you might know that on the ephod of the high priest, there was 12 stones, right? Four by three. And the names of the tribes of Israel were on those four by three. Did you know that on the shoulders were 12 stones and they were black, made of onyx, again engraved? Who the black, the black and the colourful, the life and the darkness of Israel. And the high priest went into the holy place and the most holy place on earth, carrying, carrying on his shoulders interestingly, and on his chest the colour, and on his shoulders the black. Fool, talk about Jesus. Jesus takes a body with as much blackness and darkness as any being in history. Fool, foretold by the high priest. How good is that? It does my head in. Right. Now, what we haven't spoken about, just for this last series on the tape, we've got a few more minutes, is the blood. What I was told was that life was in the blood, right? And blood is shed for sins, right? And the soul that sins shall die, definition, the soul that sins shall therefore lose its blood because life is in the blood. And therefore, the soul that sins shall die the soul that sin shall lose its lifeblood. And Jesus, therefore, his lifeblood is poured out because he's taken our sin. And because he's perfect, you know, a mathematical zero sin, any number of sins divided by zero is infinity. So his blood is infinitely capable of picking up all our sin to pay off God. What this has done in this thinking, we've ignored the flesh. 
we have totally, totally ignored the flesh and the fat tree and the origins. And we focused on the fruit of the tree, which is going out as the sin. And that understanding of blood, which is applied that way, is both pagan and doesn't work. And it's magical. And it's leaving the flesh unchanged. Is that clear? Right. Now, so what's Jesus done? Jesus, well, I'll come back to union. Flip your head into union. Jesus is holding the universe together. He's one with the Father and the Spirit. He's giving life to all. And he has now entered our dark creation. He has entered our darkness. He has got our life flowing from himself. And he's got our darkness like the high priest on his shoulders. And then he's worked that through. He has worked through in his being the brokenness of humanity and the union of humanity with God. He's worked that through. And yes, life is in the blood and his redeemed human life is poured out into the cosmos and baptizes the cosmos and picks us all up. And then he picks us all up in his ascension and he comes into the heavenly temple and he is the mercy seat in himself. He is the place of meeting between God and man and he has picked us up and through his blood that is us killing him, he has picked us up and brought us home and dad is satisfied. And dad is satisfied not because he's a blood sucking monster. Dad is satisfied because his desire from the pre-creation purpose was that we would be included in their life and their relationships and in their love. And dad's saying, yes. Dad's saying, yes, I've got what I want, which is relationship with the human race. And Jesus is saying, Dad, I've done it with you, through you in the spirit. And my blood, my life, life is the blood, my eternal life has been picked up with the redeemed human life. I've sorted out their flesh and this can be shared with them. And now in the heavenly place of meeting, the propitiation has been done, the mercy seat, the meeting has been done. And after that in Revelation, there is no more need for a temple. The temple's done away with, and then you have the heavenly city. Can you see the blood of Jesus is him, his cleaned up life poured into creation. We stabbed him in the side and out poured water, which baptized the creation and out poured blood which is his cleaned up life how good's that now we've just taken blood life is in the blood eternal life is in Christ and union or you can come back to separation and sin and darkness and mess and get locked here I prefer the other one okay that is the end of that session <laughs>